So moving forward, uh, glucose. Uh, glucose increases during aging and higher levels are associated with an increased mortality risk. So first starting with uh, how it changes during age, large study again, 12.5 million subjects. Uh, we can see that, uh, uh, so glucose levels on the Y axis and age on the X and uh, women in red, men in blue, we see that um, men increase, uh, their glucose levels increase to, to about 60 where they somewhat plateau with a further you know, additional increase towards later life in the 80s. Whereas for women, the, the increase is more linear from around 28 or so all the way up to the oldest age here. So you can see that on, uh, you know, that lowers is, is better, especially when considering that it uh, increases during aging. So somewhere around 85, 86 is, is found in biological youth. Now that, that number is important because if we look at risk of death for all causes, uh, and that's what's shown here, the hazard ratio versus the um, uh, circulating concentration of glucose levels, so the lowest point of the curve is where lowest risk for all-cause mortality would be. And that for that, it's for 80 to 94 milligrams per deciliter. So notice that below 80, uh, 80 uh, milligrams per deciliter, uh, all-cause mortality risk is significantly increased. And also anything higher than 94 is significantly increased. So um, uh, based on this large uh, data set, it, we could suggest that 80 to 94 would be optimal. So resisting the age-related increase in glucose. So again, in looking at my uh, once-a-year measurements uh, from 2005 to 2015, my average blood glucose level was 89. And then uh, as I've gotten more serious and tracked more often and track my diet, uh, it's 87.7. So when comparing these two groups of data, they are not different. So I basically resisted the age-related change in uh, glucose levels, at least for now. So how's my diet correlated with blood glucose? So um, this is actually a strong correlation between uh, blood glucose levels and my fat intake, total grams of fat per day on the x-axis. Um, and the, the, this correlation is uh, 0 0.75, so it's pretty strong. So what it's basically saying or suggesting is that as I eat more fat, my glucose levels go up, which is going in the wrong direction. Uh, and fat is not... Um, all just one thing, fats comprised of monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and saturated fats. So they may not all equally affect or be correlated with my glucose levels. So within my fat intake, the correlation between saturated fat with glucose is moderately strong. So that may be driving this association, uh, saturated fat. So uh, it, this, the easy answer would be maybe to keep my blood glucose low, just eat less saturated fat. But as we'll see in a couple slides, it may not be that simple. So going forward, C-reactive protein uh, also increases with aging and higher levels are associated with uh, a higher all-cause mortality risk. So the reference range is zero to three milligrams per liter, but that doesn't really tell us which way, you know, the, or how much CRP should be in terms of optimal for aging and risk of death for all causes. So uh, granted, not many studies, giant studies, I mean millions of subjects have looked at CRP uh, in terms of aging. Uh, the largest that I could find had 1,300 or so subjects, which is still pretty big compared to other studies. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, these aren't absolute numbers too, because even though it says it's in grams per liter, the data would back transform, uh, tra log transform, then back transform. But the magnitude of the changes is what, what's important here. So we're looking at CRP levels for men and women uh, during aging. So looking at you know the various age groups all the way up to 85 or older, we can see that for men, CRP increases more than fivefold. And for women, uh, it increases more than threefold. Now, again, as I mentioned, the reference range is from zero to three milligrams per depth per liter, but that doesn't tell us what's optimal. Is is a CRP of two just as just as good as a CRP of one or less? So let's have a look at some of that data. So less than three, uh, lower CRP, lower than three uh, is associated with a lower all-cause mortality risk. Can we go lower? So in three studies, less than one milligram per liter was associated with uh, reduced all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk. How about lower than that? Well, in these two studies, 0.86 and 0.83 milligrams per liter in these two studies. And we, we can go even further. Another two studies found 0.5 to 0.8 may be optimal. Uh, but it didn't, doesn't, doesn't stop there. Four studies uh, found that uh, CRP levels less than 0.33 milligrams per liter were associated with lowest risk of death from all causes. So uh, from this, we can conclude, or you know, the data suggests that uh, lower is better for CRP and as close to zero as you can get uh, maybe optimal. So looking at my diet with CRP, uh, and I have less data for CRP because I just started tracking it uh, last year. So I think I have eight, eight data points, two, four, 
six, yeah, I have eight data points. Uh, and the strongest correlation uh, is with my average daily fat intake. So in this case, higher fat intake, total fat intake, is correlated with a lower CRP on the y-axis. Um, and even going forward within my fat intake, uh, the, the correlation between saturated fat, actually this should be a negative correlation. Uh, so, it, so higher saturated fat intake, strongly correlated with a lower CRP in my data. So that would suggest if I eat more saturated fat and I get most of my saturated fat from coconut butter and uh, cocoa beans and make homemade chocolate with cocoa beans. Um, so that may be a good way to lower CRP, at least based on this data, but not so fast. Because if you remember a couple slides ago, uh, higher fat intake and a higher saturated fat intake were associated with higher glucose levels, which would be going in the wrong direction. So these data uh, illustrate that, you know, that it's a constant trial and error process. You know, anyone who, who uh, you know, professes to say off of one blood test, hey, this is what you should eat, I think that's you know, spurious. It, it's a constant trial and error process. And I've, as I mentioned, I have 20, up to 25 blood tests. And I'm still you know, constantly tweaking my diet to find out what's optimal across the board, not just for one or, or two biomarkers. So finding the sweet spot for that is, is key.